All right, well, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We have four fantastic speakers lined up to discuss the innovative methods they are using to study the connection between social media and youth mental health. We hope their insights will inspire your own research. It's great to see so many of you here, which speaks to the interest in and importance of this work. My name is Steph Sequera, and I'm an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Virginia, studying social experiences in youth mental health. I wanna thank the Center for Open Science and UVA's TIDE initiative for hosting this webinar today. I'm helping moderate on behalf of the TIDE initiative, and I would now like to turn it over to my co-moderator, Dr. Bethany Teachman, to introduce herself and tell you a little more about TIDE. Thanks so much, Steph. Hi, everyone. My name is Bethany Teachman. I am a professor and the director of clinical training at University of Virginia. And as Steph said, I co-direct a new initiative that UVA has launched called TIDE, Thriving Youth in a Digital Environment. We just started uh, in January. And um, we're really interested in trying to think about sort of two related questions. The first is recognizing that youth are developing in a digital context and trying to understand that in different ways and think about how we can understand in what ways it both helps and harms youth. Uh, and really move away from sort of sensational headlines and towards, uh, you know, strong science guiding how we understand the impacts. Um, and so we're thrilled to bring together uh, such a fabulous lineup of researchers to talk with us today about those issues. And then the second part of the work is really thinking about how is it that we can harness digital technologies to get youth help uh, when and where they need it most. So thinking about how we can use these technologies to really support youth mental health and their healthy development more broadly. Um, I've put a link in there. Uh, if you go to tide.virginia.edu, you can learn a little bit more about what we're up to and sign up for our newsletter so you can stay up to date on the things that we're working on. Uh, but we're thrilled to be partnering with Center for Open Science today uh, and to have such a great lineup of researchers. As, Jeff, as Steph said, we will start by hearing from Tim Arrington with the Center for Open Science to share with you a little bit about a new pilot program that they're working on. And then we have four fabulous speakers. So um, Moon Moon De Chowdhury will be speaking, followed by Yaakov Ome, Luz Powells, and then Sue Merve will bring it in. Um, and each is going to be highlighting some really innovative methods that they've been using to try to think about how to work with social media and related data in order to address these really, really challenging questions. So uh, thrilled to have uh, you all joining today. And let me turn it over to Tim now. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to speak for just a couple of minutes. I don't have any slides. Uh, so I just want to, one, I'm really excited to hear uh, all the speakers today. I think it's really well timed with an initiative. And that's what I wanted to share with you that the Center for Open Science is doing with the social media company Meta. Uh, so we just announced uh, just a couple of days ago. And if you go to our website, cos.io, you'll see uh, information there to get access. Uh, a request for proposals for researchers who are interested in studying uh, social well-being um, uh, with youth. So I think this is a very timely opportunity for data access to Instagram, um, as well as this topic itself. Uh, so there's a link right there to more information, including the request for proposals. Uh, there's more details to come just to kind of uh, forewarn people that you dive into this. Um, if you're really interested in kind of staying up to date, there's a uh, listserv that you can sign up for. I recommend that if you're interested. Uh, there'll be the key information I think everyone's interested in is what data do I get from Instagram? Uh, so that will be coming uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, the exact detailed description of what researchers like yourselves are able to recruit if you're selected for the proposals. Um, I also want to emphasize this is a pilot program. Uh, it's a step in the first direction of trying to increase transparency uh, of information of media companies like Meta. So in the end, we're anticipating only about five to seven people being selected. Uh, the hope is that we'll use this pilot period over the course of the next couple of years to be able to hopefully, if successful, um, work with groups like Meta and others to figure out how to open up more of their data for researchers like this audience. Thanks, Tim. That's fantastic. Um, uh, just before we dive in and start our research presentations, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit um, as we were you know, sending out information about this event. We had a number of people reach out to express their interest in kind of thinking about the op open science aspects of, of working with these kinds of data and different challenges that it raises and those kinds of things. And I wonder if you might share, you know, sort of what you're thinking about in terms of, 
you know, challenges in working with data like this and sharing data that can be harder to de-identify, for example, with uh, these kinds of data streams and, and just, yeah, guidance you can give to people or resources you'd want to connect them to. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a couple a couple of things that we'll be putting into place for this. And I think it's highly relevant for a lot of other types of, of research that's going to have that sensitive data. One is because of the extremely sensitive nature of what Meta will share, even though we don't know all the details, we know that it's highly sensitive. Uh, we'll end up using a clean room for that. So researchers who will get selected will have access to the data in a clean room. There's a lot of great services that do this. Uh, uh, one in the States, for example, ICPSR does a great job at you know, providing these opportunities and making it so that the data can be reshared. Uh, so we're hoping to do that to the extent possible with Meta. So I think that that's one way to do it, which is to really think hard about how you can store that data. The other one that's probably more important on top of it is consent, all right? Really thinking hard about the consent process. Uh, again, for this pilot, Meta is enabling researchers to consent. I think that's going to be the real key here for us, which is not just for the Instagram data, but any other data you might want, say a survey associated with that. Uh, really thinking hard and we'll, we'll work alongside this pilot group. And again, ICPSR has great resources among other groups to really think hard about how do I get that consent just right so that the you know uh, participant is empowered with understanding what's going to happen with their data. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tim, for sharing. And thank you, Bethany, for the great overview. Uh, just some brief housekeeping before we get started. We will have a couple minutes for questions after each presentation. Please submit any questions through the Q&A function, and then we'll monitor it and save questions for the end of each talk. Okay. Now I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Moon Moon De Chattery, who is an associate professor at the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Institute of Technology. She is renowned for her work in the fields of computational social science, human computer interaction, and digital mental health, and has made significant contributions to advancing the development of computational techniques for early detection and intervention in mental health, as well as in unpacking how social media use benefits or harms mental well being. Dr. De Chattery's research has resulted in several practical and policy implications. And she currently serves as a member of the Technical Advisory Group of the Commission for Social Connection and the World Health Organization. Dr. Jay Chowdhury, thank you for being here and please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to share my screen here. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for having me um, in this panel and this event today. Um, so as you can see from my slide, um, I'm going to be talking to you um, about uh, a big question that has been in our minds, uh, a lot of our minds over the last uh, several years, and that's the relationship between social media and mental health. And the particular way we are going to be tackling this question in this presentation is through the use of quasi-experimental approaches. So I'm going to dig deep deeper into that in just a second. So I'm going to start with um, the big picture here, right? Um, so back in 1989, um, a few decades back, um, Tim Berners-Lee at uh, what is called CERN today in Europe came up with the idea of the web, right? Um, and um, initially, this innovation of this, this what, what we call web today, um, it was supposed to be a means for scientists to share data across a then obscure platform called the Internet, a version of which was already in use by the U.S. government since the 1960s. But Berners-Lee decided to make the uh, make, make the code open source, um, and uh, the, as we know, the web took a uh, life of its own. Um, it opened opportunities uh, to be this open and democratizing platform. Um, and over the years and decades, we have seen um, the tremendous power that the web um, yields um, in different uh, spheres of our life. Um, we know that if we talk about a specific instance, social media platforms, they have played such an important role in facilitating communication and interaction among uh, people, for instance, during political protests. Uh, we know, for instance, um, 
um, uh, teens, most importantly, they are, have practically grown up on the web and social media has served as a space for them to express themselves, find their communities, solidarities, develop their own identities and so on. But obviously over the years, um, Berners-Lee also envisioned how this invention of him could be in wrong hands become uh, essentially uh, a problem. Um, and unfortunately, over and over again, we have seen his prophecy to come to um, light uh, and come to, uh, you know, uh, to be the case um, when we heard about, uh, for instance, um, foreign interference during U.S. presidential elections in recent years. Or, for instance, we um, heard uh, that oftentimes sensitive data of people from social media platforms um, have been compromised to uh, third parties uh, who should not have gotten access to it. And the list goes on. But it wasn't just Tim Berners-Lee who was thinking about these um, benefits and harms. We know that a host of scholars, many of whom are part of this um, uh, meeting and convening today, have been thinking about these benefits and harms of social media. Um, uh, we have uh, known how important these platforms can be when it comes to bringing people together in helping people manage important transitions in their lives, giving voices to marginalized populations. Uh, but at the same time, we also see news today almost every day where one or the other platform that we have today are causing mental health problems in people um, and parents and lawmakers. And I, I guess pretty much all of us here in this meeting, um, we have been having increasing concerns about the damages that are being caused by these uh, platforms on teen mental health. So this question about the relationship between social media um, and the mental health of young people. It is a question that needs a lot of attention, but answering um, which is incredibly um, challenging. It's challenging because there is an inherent measurement problem in this. Um, a measurement problem because from what we understand um, about this relationship between social media use and mental health so far has often uh, been either based on uh, people's reflections of their own activities on these platforms in the past, or it's been based um, on very coarse notion of what is social media use after all. So in my presentation today, I'm going to be talking to, to you about how we have tackled this measurement problem in my research group at Georgia Tech. Um, so the uh, examples I'm going to be drawing upon um, will show to you that we are not relying on coarse notions of, of social media use, um, but rather we are looking at actual activities of people that transpire on their social media feeds, including the way people interact with the algorithms that are driving or that are curating our experiences on these platforms. Um, the problems I'm going to be talking about also will show that we can go beyond self-reports of um, when and how people use social media, um, as research has persistently showed that we can be sometimes uh, awfully wrong about um, recalling um, about these nuanced social media users. And what I'm going to be talking about in my research is how do we quantify a naturalistic use of these platforms in situ, meaning when, where, and how people have been using these platforms. What I'm going to be talking about is also a longitudinal and a quasi-experimental observational study design where we are able to look at changes in mental health in response to different kinds of incidents or events that transpire um, on people's social media feeds. And what I'm going to be talking to you about is also how we can utilize uh, pretty sophisticated methods uh, from uh, statistics such as causal inference so that we can um, not just establish this relationship between social media use and mental health, Health, but also identify what are the causal mechanisms that explain this relationship by looking to these naturalistic data, by looking to these uh, longitudinal information. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples where we have been um, able to show the positive benefits that people get by using social media, especially in the context of mental health. Um, all of the examples I'm going to be talking uh, to you about uh, will draw upon a, a population that um, is inherently both at risk and stands to benefit from the use of these platforms. And these are individuals with known mental health struggles. So talking of the benefits, one of the biggest uh, potential uh, potentials of these social media platforms is that they provide what we can call these social pathways to care, meaning that as people pursue and look for um, care to, uh, to cope with their mental health struggles, they appropriate these platforms. So now the question is, are these platforms actually helpful to these people who are looking for help? 
Um, what I'm going to be showing uh, uh, to you is that these platforms can actually serve as these social pathways to care, providing people avenues to find communities, solidarity, um, empathy among other people. So let's look at a specific question. When people come to these platforms and um, talk about their mental health, they disclose very sensitive, otherwise stigmatizing information to their communities. Are they actually deriving any positive benefits in those contexts? So to answer that question, we, we looked at public uh, social media data derived from Twitter, where people had uh, self-disclosed that they had um, um, they have been having uh, a diagnosis or they have they are feeling um, uh, distressed. Um, uh, around those um, self-disclosures, we wanted to look at what happens. How does the community on these platforms engage? And how does this person's activity change over time? So drawing upon causal inference observational study designs, we appropriated a method called interrupted time series analysis. We looked at over 20,000 disclosure, uh, these, these uh, Twitter posts, um, and looked at over 15,000 unique disclosures also had uh, matched controls. So people who had similar activities on these platforms, but they did, did not disclose that they had uh, a diagnosis of a mental illness. What we found is that people are indeed deriving positive benefits from these platforms. And as you can see from this uh, quickly from this uh, heat map, if you look at something uh, like topical coherence, so are people uh, people's postings becoming more coherent over time um, in the aftermath of these self-disclosures? We find um, that indeed after somebody discloses, uh, in this case, a diagnosis of schizophrenia on these platforms, we can use sort of these interrupted time series study designs um, to identify how their behavior on the platforms change. And in this case, people became more coherent in how they express themselves, which in the context of this mental health condition is considered a positive outcome. But it's not just how people post on these platforms that can have positive impacts on people. How the community is responding can also have a lot of impact on people's mental health. So to answer that question, we looked at yet another social media platform and public data, in this case, Reddit. And um, we looked at several mental health support communities um, where people tend to self-disclose about their struggles and other people tend to respond, like you see in the example here. Uh, here also, we adopted um, a causal inference study design, particularly propensity score matching, where we are interested in identifying particular linguistic markers um, in uh, the content that other people are sharing uh, to, through commentary on somebody's postings in these communities and identifying whether those language um, uh, markers have any supportive elements in them. And what we find is that people are deriving support from these commentary um, that they're receiving on, on uh, their social media postings. For instance, we find that when people receive emotional support, esteem support, um, network support, uh, they feel much better in that their likelihood of talking about suicidal ideation goes down. All right, um, this was about positives. What could be methods we can use to understand the negatives of social media uh, use on um, the mental health of people? So here we turned our attention to private data, which were collected through a data donation program, um, um, an effort funded by the NSF that um, we ran for several years. Um, we recruited teens who donated their Instagram um, archives with, uh, with, uh, with a research team, and they also gave us uh, information about their mental health and experiences on, of online risks uh, through surveys. The question that we were interested in here was to understand that when teens experience negative um, uh, events, for instance, harassment on these platforms, how does this impact their mental health? Here we adopted a technique called difference and difference analysis, and we looked at private message conversations that happen on um, the Instagram uh, feeds of these individuals. Um, and what we were interested in finding is that with respect to a control group, so these would be teens who did not experience a harassment, um, uh, but were similar in demographics and other attributes, do we see a, a similar change in their mental health or not? Our hypothesis was that uh, we would see a greater uh, change in mental health, in fact, worsening mental health in, um, in the individuals and teens who uh, experienced a harassment. Um, so this approach, this difference in difference analysis, which you can see from this figure, 
tells us about this intervention effect, the intervention here being experience of harassment. And we find that we can quantify the extent to which um, mental health can be uh, negatively impacted following a harassment. What we find is that up to a 14 day period following a harassment event, uh, people tend to uh, showcase persistent symptoms of worsened mental well being that is not present in uh, a matched control. And then finally, speaking of negative impacts, I would also like to talk about the relationship between content moderation efforts and the mental health of effective users. So as you might know, um, about 10 years ago, Instagram um, banned a bunch of uh, pros eating disorder, pro Anna and uh, self-harm um, hashtags, uh, meaning that people could still use them, uh, but um, uh, they would not be searchable on the app. So the question is, did this have a positive impact on uh, the mental health of these affected, uh, of affected communities? Uh, to our surprise, we found that they did not. In fact, what we found is that uh, the communities became more insular. How did that happen? Uh, we followed this longitudinal study design where we looked at the banned hashtags and followed other co-occurring hashtags with them to see how these communities' conversations change over the course of time. And what we found is that as different hashtags got banned, these communities adopted these lexical variants, like you see in this uh, for the case of Thai Gap, um, and the communities transitioned to those more insular communities with these linguistic variants, variants which were more difficult to discover using automated um, uh, natural language uh, identification uh, techniques. And what we found is that in those variant communities, um, the discussions of mental health and well-being were much more um, uh, 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 severe and negative than it was the case with uh, the original um, tags before they were banned. All right, to start to wrap up, um, what these studies tell us is that this question about the relationship between social media use and mental health, um, it's a very complicated one. Context certainly matters, platform matters, the kind of data matters. So across the board, I talked to you about how we can look at public platforms, private platforms, even platforms which have those components, but have different spaces for public and private interactions. We looked at different populations. And what this tells us is that this relationship between social media and mental health is, uh, it can have heterogeneous impacts. So the answer to this question goes back to this measurement problem, right? How do we source information from different sources, different types of data, diverse methodologies, and how do we harness the complex but nuanced nature of social media use in answering um, that core measurement question? Um, ultimately, these platforms are here to stay. Um, so I think what is important for us is to recognize what could be ways for us and us meaning different stakeholders, um, tech industry, academia, nonprofit, and so on. How can we work together to really get at that measurement problem um, and um, come up with um, answers to this question of this nuanced yet complex relationship between social media use and mental health? That's all what I have for you today. Uh, before I close, I would like to thank all my students, collaborators, and sponsors, and importantly, the participants who donated data um, to us with, uh, with informed consent, um, without whom none of this work will be possible. I think I have time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for that fantastic presentation, Moon Moon. And we do have a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll read the first one. What was your experience with IRB and consent process with accessing private Instagram messages of participants? Uh, short answer is very complex and time consuming. Um, but the good news is that once you create a template and you identify um, the risks that could be posed by this kind of data donation, it can serve as a template for future studies. We have now used this model in a number of studies, and we do work with very vulnerable population. We work with teens. Um, um, but what I would say is um, that a couple things that uh, came up uh, and are important to this process is that we are working with minors here. Um, so it's not just we are talking about consent. We are talking about assent from these participants and consent from their legal guardians. So that it's a two-layer process. The second thing was um, the question of, you know, the fact that social media data can never be truly de-identified because you never know in text or images what kind of personally identifiable information may be present. Um, so we were very transparent in how we developed our consent processes. Uh, we um, 
uh, uh, we felt that it was important to earn the trust of uh, the participants in how the data will be collected, who will have access to it, where would it live, and whether other people would have access to it. In our case, only the research person will have that access. So I think, you know, building that trust and that relationship so that participants feel like um, uh, they are on the same side as the research team is super important for this kind of study design. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat. I'm just going to remind participants, if you could put your questions in the Q&A, that would be really helpful. I'm seeing some questions come up in the chat, which we'll save, um, but just for organizing would be great. Uh, one more question in the Q&A. How does the study define worsening mental health outcomes expressed through social media behavior? I think this is referring to the last study that you presented. Yeah, so uh, we have adopted different ways depending upon uh, the specific question that we are asking. Um, in some cases, it uh, it has used self-reported data. Uh, we have used standardized screening tools um, that are used in the mental health domain. Um, in other cases, um, we have uh, used people's um, self-disclosure and uh, on these platforms about changes in their mental well-being. Um, and then finally, we have also uh, developed machine learning classifiers that are trained on uh, high quality uh, gold standard data of mental health markers and then use transfer learning to validate those classifiers in the context um, of a new domain or a new platform or new kind of data. Um, finally, we also, a lot of our research uh, also involves uh, clinical psychologists and practitioners of mental um, health. Um, uh, and we feel that that is very important because for this kind of work, we want to have the right uh, safety protocols and risk mitigation approaches, especially, again, we are dealing with uh, sometimes a minor population um, and population who um, uh, already might be vulnerable to various kinds of um, uh, uh, challenges. Great. And I think we have time for one more question that I have in the chat. Are there challenges you have come across or solutions for working with social media data in multiple languages? Great question. Um, the work that I presented here, and um, uh, to be frank, vast majority of my work is uh, in English language. Um, but that said, I have done some work um, in the global South context, um, where uh, people, you know, might be speaking English, but have different cultural norms. Um, so uh, what we have found is that, you know, if we use pre trained machine learning models on those data, um, they sometimes don't generalize very well to those different cultural contexts. Um, um, uh, normally, we find that um, the uh, computational uh, tools that are available in English language, the quality that we get from them, do not extend to other languages. And this is a persistent problem uh, in this space uh, where this question of the relationship between uh, youth mental health and social media use goes far beyond um, uh, sort of people who interact in English. Uh, but one way to, uh, to tackle that um, has been to look at non-language data. So in our work, we not only look at language data, but we also look at social interaction uh, patterns. Uh, we look at uh, their uh, patterns of activity on these platforms. Um, and um, uh, we find that, uh, you know, uh, the complementary uh, advantages that are offered by these different kinds of measures uh, sometimes helps helps to offset, even if it, to a smaller extent, um, these cultural differences and language differences. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sorry if you had a question that we weren't able to get to in the time, but we encourage you to, to follow up after. And I'm going to now turn it to uh, Bethany to continue with our next speaker. Great. Yes. Thank you for the fabulous talk, Moon Moon, and uh, the great questions and We'll try to get to as many of them as we, we can during uh, our conversation today. It's my pleasure right now to introduce Dr. Yakov Ome, who leads the Digital News Dynamics Research Group at the Weizenbaum Institute in Berlin, uh, and is also a fellow at the Digital Communication Methods Lab at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he explores the impact and dissemination of professional journalism on digital platforms as compared to other sources like influencers or AI. Uh, he has been dedicated to advancing digital methodologies in different forms of communication, including political communication, journalism research, um, and does it through really innovative use of digital trace data. So um, please join me in welcoming Jakob.
Sorry, I was still muted. Um, yes, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction and for having me at this um, very interesting event, uh, also with the cause initiative that, of course, uh, is kind of like uh, highly appreciated. So what I'm going to do is to talk a bit more about the method details and not so much about the, the context uh, and kind of like uh, specific research projects. And I'm going to focus on digital trace data specifically and data donations as a method uh, to gather them, because I think this is kind of like coming close to what we can expect from the cost meta uh, collaboration, because in the end, uh, this will be digital trace data um, that uh, meta hopefully uh, kind of like provides for for Instagram. Um, starting very brief with the original idea of media effects research, and probably many of you are familiar with, uh, with this, but I'm just kind of like wanting to point out that the original idea is always to kind of like have an independent variable that explains an outcome variable. My focus of research is not digital well-being on uh, um, and kind of like youth uh, when it comes to um, technology use, I'm much more focusing on uh, whether media use, for example, kind of like uh, uh, strengthens political participation, changes political knowledge of people or affects political opinions. So that's kind of like my, my field of research. But I think the idea that we have some kind of like uh, independent variable, this can be media usage, uh, content exposure, or information engagement, and we expect to at least have a relationship with an outcome variable, whatever this may be, or we also kind of like are interested uh, to see whether um, the independent variable can explain some change uh, in outcome variables over time uh, to form a, a causal uh, relationship there is probably something that is um, relatable to, to many of you, although the research areas might be different. Um, and for the outcome variable, I think it's important to kind of like say that uh, some sometimes we are closer to states and sometimes we are closer to, to traits there. Um, and uh, I will come back to this because this will affect the, the way you can actually use digital trace data. When we, uh, and Moon Moon has just kind of like mentioned this, when we look back on how we used uh, the independent variable of media exposure uh, broadly, um, we use self-reports most of the time and they come with uh, some kind of like heavy limitations. Uh, one of them is recall bias. Um, the other one very often is that we don't have content data. So we kind of like do not really know what people actually saw. Um, uh, and it's already difficult to kind of like ask people to estimate the time they spend on any kind of like platform, but it's impossible for them to kind of like also recall specific content. So we very often uh, in social media effects research do not look at content. And then we have this short term uh, exposure that is very difficult for people to uh, to recall in the first place. And now we have kind of like, since, I don't know, the platforms are there and uh, we kind of like get a bit better uh, access to data, um, we have the chance to uh, use digital trace data for media effects research. Um, and I will just kind of like briefly say that what I understand the digital, digital trace data is information that is automatically locked uh, or collected by platforms. Um, by digital devices or online activities that people are actually doing there. This can be user interactions, behaviors, transactions, um, uh, whatever happens on the platform. And it can be analyzed to gain insights into individual behavior. And as Moon Moon said, there are kind of like a, a couple of advantages coming with this. So it's observed behavior. It's not self-reported. Um, there is no recall bias in this. There are a couple of other issues uh, in a sense of that if people use a device, you never know if they are only using it or it's only used by one person or a couple of others. But in general, um, we get uh, around the recall bias and we kind of like, depending on the platform, uh, also get uh, insights into the content exposure that people are actually having, which is why I think this is um, a helpful way to kind of like advance our um, understanding and get to better research and and uh, being able to make stronger causal uh, inferences than than this was done uh, previously um so my interest mostly is to use these digital trace data in longitudinal analyses um, which basically uh, means that we have uh, several measures general uh, uh, population survey for example at wave one and wave two 
Um, and in these kind of surveys, we measure uh, attitudes, for example, but this can also be kind of like any well-being uh, uh, indicator or what have you. So things that can change over time. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, these kind of lines between the um, between the boxes kind of like show you, okay, this is a digital trace data. So this is the individual trajectories that people are basically taking on platforms, jumping from entertaining to political content, for example, um, but also kind of like any other social interaction that is actually happening there. And ideally, right, so this is a bit ideal, but ideally we have these data and um, can use them to see whether we can explain a change between uh, wave one and wave two when it comes to attitudes or well-being indicators or something like this. Um, this means you have to classify these digital trace data, uh, which is something that I think a lot of people are working on right now, um, but that also kind of like poses no new questions um, to us. But ultimately, we will be able uh, to better explain causal relationships with these multi-wave uh, longitudinal data collection um, uh, studies. How do we gather these um, uh, digital trace data. So I'm kind of like focusing on, on data donations. And I recently got back from, um, from uh, Australia and there people kind of like framed what I'm talking about now, uh, the, Euro, the Euro way of data donation. So apparently around the world, there are different understandings um, on, on what is meant here. But so what I mean by data donation is the donation of existing digital traces with informed consent by users. Um, and there are different ways of actually getting there. Um, and I think in the what's interesting for, for, for Europe at least, but I think platforms have changed this based on this around the world. We had some kind of like legislation here, which is called GDPR. Um, and uh, that mandated platforms to give users access to um, their own data that platforms hold uh, about their um, usage in on digital platforms, um, which meant it opened a new window uh, for people to actually um, download their data and donate this uh, to research. Um, so this is why it's called data donations. This is from a, from a paper uh, we recently published, um, this table, but for me, why are data donations so interesting compared to API uh, data or tracking uh, data, for example? So they are user centric, centric. That means we can kind of like make individual level data analysis, uh, which, for example, is very difficult with, with API um, data. They are collected uh, retrospectively, um, which means uh, you kind of like collect existing digital trace data, uh, which makes it actually a bit easier um, to put this into these longitudinal data uh, collections with multiple waves. Um, and what I also find important is that users actually get uh, to consent and no, they see the data before they actually consent sharing them, uh, which kind of like from a transparency perspective, I like much better than a prospective tracking where you have to heavily whitelist things and so on. And people actually will never know what, uh, what uh, researchers get there. Um, and I think this would change their behaviors probably stronger than if you kind of like say, can you give me the history of uh, your last six months of, um, of uh, yeah, uh, social media platform use. So how do data donations work? In the end, they're quite simple, at least in this Europe uh, uh, or EU approach. Um, you kind of like request data download packages from platforms. And this, this is uh, on the on the left hand side, you see the meta one and you can all do this. This is kind of like rolled, uh, rolled out worldwide um, and you can download uh, your information. Um, and then on a researcher side, uh, this is just from a study that we are conducting right now, you have a website where um, you kind of like lead people. And then this is where they kind of like find manuals on how to download these data, but then also they have the opportunity um, to uh, actually donate them uh, and upload these data to a specific platform um, that we are operating. And then they can kind of see the data that they are actually sharing with us. They can delete all the data um, that they don't want to share with us. Um, and in the end, we have kind of like a, a very, I think, clean process. The issue is that if you think about how does it really work, it is a bit more complicated um, because you have to kind of like, um, first of all, recruit people, you have to get the consent, you have to um, ask survey questions, then you kind of like refer them 
uh, to the um, data donation platform. Then we have different platforms which have different requirements, unfortunately. Um, and I hope this is kind of like changing. But right now, the platforms, let's say, don't make this very easy because every platform uh, works differently. Um, there are different times uh, you have to wait uh, until your data uh, download package is ready, for example. And that makes it all for researchers um, quite tricky uh, to actually get people to really don donate um, um, their data. Um, so it is a bit of a, of a tedious process, um, but it, of course, uh, the data you get is kind of like very, um, very nuanced. And that's why uh, we think it's worth doing this. What data you can get, and I think this is what everyone's waiting from the uh, COS uh, meta initiative right now. So this is kind of like a list of um, things that you can actually get from, a, from in, I now took TikTok um, uh, as an example. Um, so you can get, uh, TikTok is the best, I would say, when it comes to the data you can get on exposure because you have a, a watch history, you have a video browsing history where you get like a timestamped uh, link. Um, and with this link, you can kind of like infer uh, the content that people have been exposed and you really have kind of like trajectories. Um, but you can kind of uh, see um, that there is a, a lot of things in there, which also means you have to minimize data uh, if, you, if you don't want to just collect everything and you have to make choices. And it's also kind of like, this is what's in there. And if you need something else, you will not get it, right? Because that's, that's basically what platforms are, are giving you here. When it comes to analyses, um, of course, you get like a huge amount of data. So in the invitation, we were asked to, to talk a bit about uh, how to deal with this. So yes, you need kind of like server space and you definitely also need computing power that goes beyond what you can do on a local machine. Um, I think most institutions can, can help you there, but you have to kind of like understand that this is um, a different uh, amount of data, even uh, compared to uh, API data or so on, which is also still kind of manageable. But here um, you will get kind of um, uh, multiple uh, gigabytes, probably in the hundreds of gigabytes, if you do this with a, with a um, sample of thousand people or something like this. And what's more important is you get these data and you need to classify them. Um, this is something we are working on right now. And I think not so many people in this media effects research field has, have actually done this. So if you want to study news or if you want to study, I don't know, body images, you need to kind of like classify these data. And there's no way that you can do this manually. You can kind of like uh, have training data sets that help you to uh, then have an automated classification, um, but uh, you need to find new ways to actually classify data so they can help you uh, to um, yeah, give uh, answers to the questions that you're having. And lastly, um, for the longitudinal questions, you also need to find a way what do you actually do with six months of exposure data. So what do they mean, right? It's a sequence, but what sequence, uh, what can a sequence actually tell you, which is also something many of us are not so familiar with. Pros and cons, um, I kind of like said this already, but I think it's maybe nice to have a list like this. So for me, the pro is the retrospective collection because um, people will have the transparency to look at the data, um, the possibility to review them, the timestamp content exposure, and uh, the possibility to combine this with self-reports makes, makes this for me a very strong method. Um, it is costly and labor intensive. Um, it can produce sample biases. I've done multiple studies now where we always check for sample biases and you have to kind of like be aware that if you kind of have a have a general population sample of thousand people, of course, not everyone will kind of like donate their data. There will be different uh, issues with um, the technology and uh, some people don't want to do this. And we kind of like see in the data that we have people with a bit lower privacy risk who usually consent and donate to this and who are usually a bit younger. I would say they are not crazily varying in terms of biases, so it's not completely off, but it's something to, to keep in mind. We need these new analytical approaches and we are still dependent on platforms. If the platform changes something in the process or in the in the data donation package, you basically start from scratch when you run a study like this, which is um, not always uh, fun. Um, what are they good for? Um, I think they are good for um, studying long-term trends rather than short-term changes. Um, and so I would say they are better in actually looking at... Um, traits uh, than at states because it's retrospective. 
Um, it's easier to utilize uh, for if yeah effect research uh, on traits and states, what I just said. Um, they are better to study patterns and mechanisms rather than representative distributions because you will not get a representative sample uh, um, of people who donate this, or at least I haven't seen a study that actually managed it. Um, and they are good for these analyses of non-aggregated exposure rather than uh, the engagement uh, uh, metrics um, that you can use. Looking at open science practices, um, which uh, for me kind of like what is really difficult is that the um, high outcome uncertainty when you kind of like um, gather these data, you basically never really know what the data will look like, if things will change, what kind of time frame platforms will actually give you. There's right now with TikTok, there's huge uh, dispute about because the data donation packages don't work as well as they used to do. Um, but the software for donation that we are using, which is called Port, which was uh, developed in, in the Netherlands, um, that is, for example, open source, um, and you can um, deploy that yourself. Um, the syntax for analysis um, uh, can, of course, be changed, uh, uh, can, of course, be shared and will be shared also in our project. Um, but you have to say that it's subject to platform changes. So it's very likely that you cannot just rerun this, uh, but have to kind of like maintain the code, which is, I think, one of the biggest issues that we're having. Um, we have these uh, new formats of direct platform researcher corporations, uh, which I find interesting. Um, but um, of course, they also need to prove themselves. Um, and the data sharing uh, is a challenge right now. We only do this on aggregated data because uh, we would not never share these individual level data. Um, but when it comes to a reproduce reproducibility, um, that is also kind of like an issue uh, that you have to take into account that people cannot uh, do this uh, completely. So um, that's basically most of the things I want to draw the attention to what I actually think we will look at in the future, um, which is called what we call augmented data donation packages, so that we will have data donations, um, but we will need to do something with them, right? So and what we're doing with TikTok, for example, right now is we um, have the URLs of people, uh, but then we scrape the content, we get the metadata from the videos, we get the content, we kind of like train a multimodal classifier that can deal with this. Um, uh, um, video data and then in the end you kind of like get to something uh, like an augmented data set that will actually be uh, giving you the answers to the questions that you're actually having so what I want to say with this is basically um, the trace data themselves they are not very helpful when they just lie on your on your drives or servers but uh, the, the real fun starts when you actually kind of like have to um, analyze them and um, there are different ways of doing it and I think it's all possible but I think we will this kind of like matching data uh, sources will be one of the the big challenges uh, in the future um, I have examples on what we have been doing there but I think I will just skip them uh, for now and thank you for your attention thank you so much Jakob this was uh, absolutely fantastic um, and a ton of questions have come in while you were chatting so I'm going to do one with you uh, and just in the interest of time. But for speakers, if you have time to write responses into chat for some of the others to that you are able to respond to, fantastic. The more we can share, the better. And for those who've been asking, yes, we will be sharing the recording of this. So you'll have a chance to go back. And we're also going to be um, sending out a very brief survey after if you want to receive training in some of these different methods and learn more about them, let us know. And we'll try to think about ways that we can try to create those opportunities. That's a, a big goal of Pi to try to sort of increase research capacity across the field in these ways. Let me toss one question at you, though. I'm going to combine a few different ones that came in, which is if you can talk Yagov, about um, some of the different types of biases that you might encounter in these data and how you think about them. So people asked about, like, are you thinking that there might be selective deletions of highly sensitive data? Are how you think about the impact of missing data uh, and how that biases the conclusions you're drawing, impact of bots or fake data that are coming in? So there are a number of questions of like different types of biases that might be introduced. Can you give us yeah. a one minute teaser on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's say it like this. This is apparently the hot topic also for reviewers. This is always where it gets. Uh, I would say uh, we are using in general never unbiased data in in uh, in most of the research that we're doing. Um, so I think just this this method introduces maybe a couple of 
uh, small different ones. So interestingly enough, we did a screenshot sharing uh, donation study um, and there people were very open in sharing their uh, kind of like, I don't know, um, hour long um, uh, dating app usage and so on and so forth. So I think the sensitivity uh, of people is not as high as we might um, uh, expect it there, but it very de much depends. If this is your core research question, then of course, kind of like that's a different problem than if this is a, a bycatch in the sense of, well, do I share also uh, some content data there? Um, and I think I would kind of like approach this in the sense of if this is my core research question, then I would, of course, kind of like tell people when getting informed consent that this is highly valuable information and we would encourage them to share. Um, that doesn't mean that the, in the end, it's their decision whether they delete uh, highly sensitive data. And I mean, if, if I want to do kind of like... I don't think Pornhub has a has a DDP uh, output, but if that's the study that I want to do, then of course I might find other um, other right. ways of actually gathering this. But in general, I think um, we need you just need to kind of like I think you need to report on this. Um, but uh, we know, for example, what uh, that people deleted something. We don't know what they deleted, of course, but this is all about transparency, basically, to say, okay, there are some issues here, and uh, we might have some flaws. But on the other hand, um, given that this is uh, sometimes month-long uh, exposure data, um, I don't expect that kind of like people um, dive deep into this and delete half of it, uh, something like right. this. And I mean, fake and bot data, I haven't encountered anything in this data donation approaches because you usually kind of like recruit people via online access panels or something like this, where I would have some kind of trust that at least there are no bots in there. Um, and I haven't experienced anything like that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, appreciate the great insights. Let me turn it to you, Steph, to introduce Luz. Yes, thank you, Jakob. So next, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Luz Powells, who is an assistant professor of developmental psychology at Red Bad University in Megan. She conducts research at different time intervals, ranging from multiple assessments per day to across multiple years, to gain new insights into individual and group differences and use socio-emotional functioning in their online and offline social worlds. Dr. Powell uses several innovative paradigms in her work, such as experience sampling, data donations, peer nominations, person-specific methods, and advanced longitudinal data and analytic techniques. We are very happy to have her with us today. Thank you for this great introduction. I'm going to tell you more about some innovative methods to measure the effects of social media use on closeness to friends. Let me see. Um, and it's based on the idea, I think, in the past week, at least in the Netherlands, had a lot of negative attention on the effects of social media use. Um, also, uh, based on the book of Hyde, for example, that uh, social media may destroy uh, the generation of adolescents and maybe the cause of the mental health crisis. But there may also be positive effects of social media use, and one of that is that it may stimulate closeness to existing friends. And uh, so called the stimulation hypothesis, it states that uh, yeah, if you use social media together with your friends, it may stimulate uh, your friendships and may make you feel even closer to your friends than uh, you were before. There's actually quite some evidence already for this hypothesis based on empirical research, for example, and also uh, quite some reviews uh, support this idea. And if you ask it, adolescents themselves, also the majority has an idea that social media has a positive effect on their friendships. And only 7% thinks that it uh, may be negative. So all in all, we know already quite a bit about uh, social media using closeness to friends. But what I was particularly interested in is what about more and more real-time momentary experiences? Because so far, most of the work has been um, cross-sectional in nature or uh, longitudinal studies across multiple years. But if you look at social media platforms, then, for example, Be Real uh, focuses on one notification sent to everyone. You only have two minutes to share to all your friends, and then uh, they also ask for a reaction or a comment. Um, also, with regard to uh, Instagram, it really has prompt to share your messages with a friend or a group. And especially Snapchat really focuses on sharing in-the-moment experiences with your friends. So I think because this prompt really um, highlights a momentary 
experiences. Uh, it may also be interesting to study um, the associations of social media use and friendship closeness also at a more momentary level. And uh, that's what we did in this uh, experience sampling study. We uh, pre-registered the study, also uh, the data and the materials. But I have to say one challenge that we experienced was that it was quite a lot of work to set up the whole project. We recruited uh, about 400 adolescents. So um, there was not that much time left to uh, complete a pre-registration of the whole project with multiple PhDs and postdocs. So what we did is we pre-registered the analysis plan of the papers after the data collection has been finished. So that is what we commonly do, commonly do in more longitudinal measurement burst designs because um, yeah, you don't have enough time to uh, pre-register everything before data collection starts. Um, what were our specific hypotheses? So first, we want to replicate more previous studies that were between person and nature, and we asked which adolescents feel closest to their friends. We thought, okay, that will be the frequent social media users. And then we were interested in, okay, but when do adolescents feel closest to their friends? So a within person question. And we thought, okay, that will be after using social media as compared to when they didn't use social media. So we asked the which and a when question. And we did it using experience sampling uh, methodology. We ask about 400 adolescents six times per day for three weeks to report on their uh, social media use. For example, have you been in touch with your close friends in the previous hour? And we were in this study uh, particularly interested, for example, whether or not they've used Instagram uh, with their friends. And uh, we also ask them multiple times per day how close to their friends do they feel right now. And then uh, we had different ways to analyze this uh, association. And I'll tell you a bit more about uh, these different methods. First, uh, as I said, we were interested in the between person association. And we had the aim to examine the association between individual differences in friendship closeness and social media use. And to uh, compute a between person association, individuals only have to be measured once. So you could examine just one uh, survey, but you can also take, for example, the aggregated level of friendship closeness and social media use across the three weeks of the ESM study so that you have one score for each individual. So here we have different individuals, all with uh, one score. And then uh, if you compute association, what we found is that individuals who use social media more often on uh, average also experience more friendship closeness as compared to others. So the between person level, the stimulation hypothesis uh, was supported. Then uh, we also are interested, in, we're interested in a within person association. And the aim was to examine the effect of social media use on intra individual changes in friendship closeness over time. And for that individuals uh, to Examine that individuals have to be measured repeatedly, for example, at least uh, three times. We have more than that, but just for illustrative purposes, I show you the individuals again with the different time points. But now uh, we weren't interested in the mean scores of the persons, but the variation around their own uh, mean. And, and what you see then is that you uh, look at the trends within individuals on average across the individuals, we found that they experienced less friendship closeness after using uh, more social media as compared to moments when they used less social media. So um, the hypothesis wasn't supported and yeah, although the effect was very small, it was uh, significant and uh, yeah, we found the opposite uh, pattern of findings that we expected. So it really shows that it's important to disentangle within person associations from between person association because they are different and maybe even opposing. Um, then we went one step further because we also were interested in more person specific associations. And uh, the idea behind that is uh, to examine how the effects of social media use and intra individual changes vary from person to person. And therefore, individuals have to be measured repeatedly over time, for example, uh, more than 50 times 
Then with techniques like uh, dynamic structural equation modeling, you can really determine the individual effects of each individual person. So here again, we have three persons. The person in red experienced a negative effect of social media use after um, a negative effect of friendship closeness after using social media. The person in green experiences a positive effect. And there's a person in yellow who doesn't experience um, any effects of his or her social media use. And um, we looked at that in our sample and we found that for about 36% there was a negative association, for 25% a positive association, and for the other adolescents there was um, no uh, association that was uh, yeah, meaningful. So what does this uh, research show? We found only partial support for the stimulation hypothesis because at the between person adolescent at between person level, which adolescents felt closer to the closest to their friends or were the frequent uh, Instagram users. But within person, when do adolescents feel closest to their friends? Only about 25% felt closer after using Instagram. And um, although this research is insightful and also shows that uh, effects may vary from person uh, to person. I think um, the same limitations that uh, Mamoun and Jacob already discussed also apply to ASM research, for example, recall bias, although the time period of which you report is usually shorter than in surveys. We still know that adolescents in ESM research are relatively inaccurate in estimating, for example, the time spent on social media or all the posts they have seen, for example, in the previous hour. Um, also in ESM research, we should move beyond time spent on social media. And it's also really, yeah, relatively time evasive for participants to um, participate in these types of studies. And for researchers, it's also invasive because, for example, you have to pay the participant to provide some money to um, yeah, participate in these studies. You should send them uh, reminders, uh, motivate them as much as possible, for example, by building a more personal bond with them. And uh, you only have limited items that you can include because the shorter the questionnaire, the more chance that you have a high compliance rate. But that limits the amount of information that you can collect with ESM data. So in a new project, Project Social, um, I want to uh, build further on uh, explaining the heterogeneity in social media use effects on uh, social connectedness, like friendship closeness. And my idea will be to build a new overarching theoretical framework that explains in what context, among whom and when social media use increases or decreases social connectedness among adolescents. And for that, uh, I want to combine different sources of data, because I think if you combine different data uh, collection methods, we can get um, yeah, unique insights. And the idea is to combine experience sampling methods with uh, data donations that uh, Jacob already nicely uh, describes. So first participants uh, uh, participate in the ESM study, by the report on social media use and friendship closeness. And at the end, they are uh, requested to um, do uh, donate their uh, social media data. And I think the nice thing is of uh, combining this design is that you can also use the prompts that you can send to the adolescent's phone to give them instructions and send them reminders regarding the data donation process. So, um, yeah, you're, they're already used to get in touch with you for multiple days, and maybe that bond helps them to also um, yeah, donate the data to you as a researcher. I'm also going to um, link the data to an ongoing um, longitudinal follow-up because I recruit participates from, participants from an ongoing longitudinal study, and their um, not only self-reported measures of social connectedness are conducted, but also peer nominations on, for example, which resumes are most popular, uh, which are least popular. So I think it's a rich combination of uh, self and peer nominations with experience sampling and data donations. And this is what a data donation process will look like. I think um, Jacob already described a nice overview of the process, but I want to shortly tap into some challenges that may be particularly interesting with regard to my projects. 
first, um, if you look at adolescents and uh, social media use, you can get uh, informed consent, but then uh, yeah, participants need to request and the data donation package. But of course, each adolescent uses different platforms and um, it's also um, hard for them sometimes to uh, download data from multiple platforms because you also need to wait a couple of hours or days before uh, you get the data after you've downloaded it. So it's quite challenging to combine those different uh, the data donation packages within one uh, study. Then after they requested the data donation package, they uh, need to download it after they received it from the platform. And as I mentioned, the delay uh, may uh, make that some participants uh, drop out. Then I think it's especially, um, um, yeah, worries me is the privacy uh, components. Because on the one hand, for example, if you want to study social connections among adolescents, you want to have as many adolescents as possible to participate in your study and also to have a representative sample. But uh, the information is also highly privacy sensitive and some adolescents may not be willing to share the data, especially if you have more sensitive information about their uh, conversations that they have together. And questions I was worrying about, okay, what if uh, someone admits to another adolescent that uh, he or she wants to commit suicide? What responsibility do you have as a researcher if you see that information in the conversations uh, that you get? And um, it may also be a reason for someone not to uh, join the project. So I thought, okay, for now, I only focus more on the activities time sense and usernames, so what, when, and with whom adolescents are using social media, and um, ignore the content, although it may be very insightful uh, in terms of information, but uh, also privacy sensitive. Um, yeah, Jacob already explained the process. They can expect uh, data before they provide consent. And I think especially regarding to the data processing and content analysis, he, al he already uh, nicely um, show that it's challenging to analyze the big data that you get from this and to link it to the self and be reports. Um, but I think there are promising future directions in this. I think Jaka presented some also in this special issue. There are some other papers of, for example, um, large language models of visual content analysis. So uh, I think it's worthwhile to have a look at it. Um, I hope in my research that I can combine these methods or that you can create uh, impacts by investigating how adolescents offline and online interactions are interconnected and how inter-person inter, uh, specific differences could be explained and, and that really helps us to tailor social media policy and advise more to the needs of individual adolescents. And I hope it will inspire you to, uh, yeah, contribute to these uh, important research questions. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Luz. We have any questions from the audience or panelists, also feel free to ask questions if you have any. I have a oh, go for it then, that's great. No, oh, no, okay. no. <laughs> um, I have a quick question, actually. So I've been doing some focus groups with adolescents to better understand their social media use. And I've been learning about how differently they use platforms like WhatsApp and text messaging versus things like Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. And in your first study, I'm curious, since you were able to assess what, like how they were communicating, whether you're able to look at any differences in the association between friendship, closeness, and social media use, depending on the type of platform they were using. Yeah. That's an interesting question. We didn't find large differences between the platforms. We looked at Instagram, WhatsApp, and Snapchat at the moment. But uh, since we conducted the study, I think the media landscape changes rapidly. So now we have TikTok, Be Real, uh, for example. But I think it also really varies from adolescent to adolescent and also within groups of friends, what platform they're using. Uh, I think now in the Netherlands, most adolescents are Snapchat also for the interactions with friends. They only use WhatsApp, for example, for conversations with adults. But uh, I think a few years ago, it was still different. So um, 
it's a, I think most important to look at the functions of the different platforms mm -hmm. and that they offer us than the platform in itself because it's so yeah but subject to change so uh, as long as yeah so we're done studying it the platform may already be used in a different ways by the adolescents yeah thank you all right i think i will uh hand it back to bethany to round out our last speaker Great. Thank you, Luz. Super interesting work. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Sumer Vaid, who is a postdoctoral research associate at Harvard Business School in the Negotiation, Organization and Markets Unit. Uh, he earned his PhD and MA in Media Psychology at Stanford. Um, and his doctoral dissertation um, on heterogeneity and social media and well-being associations was awarded the 2024 Psychology of Technology Institute Dissertation Award. Um, and in his research, Sumer studies a psychological fit through the lens of digital media in different contexts, ranging from markets to organizations. Um, it does fascinating work um, and identifies as a computational social scientist. And he often uses Bayesian methods to analyze intensive longitudinal data that I'm excited for him to share a little bit about with you now. Thank you very much um, for organizing this webinar and for having me. It's enthralling to be next to this stellar lineup of speakers, all of whom are my role models. And I'll, I'll try my best to contribute to a discussion that I think they have um, already, you know, contributed very extensively to. So, okay, so today um, I'm really just going to be talking about the importance of context. It's a term that we've heard very often uh, today, uh, but we will kind of motivate uh, a, a need to study context when looking at social media and well-being. You know, we will kind of focus a bit on the past research, but then we will really kind of dive in uh, into a specific definition of context since we have a multidisciplinary audience here and we probably define contexts in different ways. Um, and then we will kind of go into uh, some methods related guidance pertaining to studying context in relation to social media use and well being. Um, I will quickly talk about two papers um, and my experiences in working with data uh, that includes context. Um, and, and what researchers can do to, to better study this variable um, and provide some tips and tricks that can help researchers um, move along in, in this process faster than I did with my dissertation about a year ago. Um, okay, so, you know, just taking a step back, uh, to state the obvious, really, um, emerging research has suggested that the relationship between social media and, and well-being is uh, very heterogeneous um, and it partially depends on a variety of factors such as how well-being is operationalized for instance and then as Lois was saying uh, you know on people's dispositions and and these kind of trade double constructs that we have um, and and here we introduce you know a kind of a third kind of cool variable along which social media and well-being effects might differ which is the context in which social media is being used um, and the reason any of this is important, you know, at least in, in our eyes as researchers, is because really when we look at internet usage by device, we see that there is a, a near monopoly of mobile devices in, in terms of how people get online. Um, you know, desktops are a thing of the past, tablets, smartphones, mobile phones, that's how people get online. Um, and as a result, kind of Facebook, you know, saw or, or foreshadowed uh, today's landscape back in 2011, when Facebook's chief product officer kind of claimed that Facebook wanted to be a mobile company. And, and back then it wasn't, you know, back then it was a desktop based platform, strictly speaking. Uh, but as of 2022, the vast majority of Facebook users are mobile. Um, and, and what this means, we think, um, is, is not just that, you know, kind of going beyond Facebook, we have other social media platforms like uh, Instagram, TikTok, as has been said today. Um, if you look at some of these platforms, WhatsApp originated entirely on the smartphone, so it was mobile to begin with. Um, you know, Instagram uh, is a camera-based uh, social media platform, as a Snapchat said, so has to be based on a smartphone. Um, and, and whereas other traditional uses of, of social media, such as online gaming, you know, MMORPGs, might still be uh, on desktop computers, but this kind of new age uh, social media is is very definitely um, based on the smartphone. And so the reason that I'm emphasizing all of this is because social media as a result has mobilized. And, and what's happening is that people are using social media when they're commuting uh, or when they're with their loved ones or when they're alone at home. And uh, these, uh, these different psychological contexts, we think, uh, should play a crucial role in helping us understand 
why there is so much heterogeneity and con conditionality on, on social media and well-being associations. So um, from kind of a more, you know, calm and psych perspective, uh, since that is my training, um, there are at least three prominent theoretical frameworks that all kind of converge around this notion that um, context is really an important variable when social media is being studied in relation to psychological states. Uh, obviously, Patty Valkenberg's uh, very influential framework makes a claim about macro social context. Uh, we have claims about context specific factors also being made by more mobile communication scholars such as Marik. Um, and uh, psychologists have also long recognized that the so called affordances of the offline environment play a crucial role in shaping um, how we feel after using social media platforms. So I know this is a method stock, but you know, coming coming to this question from a, from a theoretical perspective, we already have a lot of motivation to study context as a key variable. Okay, so um, let's define context. Uh, as I said, the term has been thrown around a lot earlier uh, during the, the the many spectacular talks that were given. Um, but let's kind of break down this multifaceted uh, construct into simpler, more digestible parts. So, if you look at physical context, this is one facet of overall context variables. Uh, which captures uh, the place that people are in. Um, and some ways to measure this variable is to, uh, you know, ask people where they are currently uh, using experience sampling designs uh, and or we can sense or objectively assess where people are using the global positioning sensor that is embedded in their smartphones. Um, social context is not entirely orthogonal or independent from physical context, but it is... Um, noteworthy enough to have its own designation. Um, social context is essentially the kind of social company that people are momentarily engaged in, you know, uh, if they are at a bar or if they're in a library and, and that kind of spectrum of social uh, contexts that, that exist in the middle of those two extremes. Um, and once again, we can always ask people about their social contexts, uh, but today's technologies and, and the work of my advisor, Gabby Harari, do allow us to um, objectively assess uh, the sociability of the situation using the microphone sensor and the Bluetooth sensor that is in a smartphone. Behavioral context, again, um, is, is just the kind of co-occurring activities that take place uh, while people are engaging in social media use. There is a lot of work that suggests that uh, today's media diets are very fragmented and that we only spend, uh, you know, more not more than a few seconds looking at our phones before we do something else, and then come back to our phones. So it's important, really, to understand what what other behaviors we are engaged in, um, and 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 you know how those might impact our subsequent feelings of wellness after we have used a smartphone. Um, and again, that can be measured, you know, from smartphone sensing methods and through ESM designs. Um, but perhaps my favorite, and also in some ways the most controversial, is the psychological context that an individual is inhabiting. Until recently, it was very hard to measure this, even using self-report designs, because fundamentally speaking, psychological context is so subjective um, and, and qualitative. But, but recently, there have been innovations from personality psychologists in establishing taxonomies of situations and um, helping us measure uh, in, in, in somewhat of a quote-unquote objective way the situations that people occupy. Okay, um, so all of this to say, you know, you could have just read my advisor's paper and none of that would have been necessary. But, but you know, um, the smartphone is, is a powerful tool. Um, it allows us to measure all kinds of contexts. Um, we can talk about smartphone sensing forever, though I think Gabby should really be the one giving that talk. My own work is focused on social media specifically and well-being. So that's what we will kind of segue into. Uh, but do read this paper if you're interested in the nitty gritties of how smartphone sensing can inform um, context sensing. Okay, so the first paper that I kind of really want to talk about um, merges two, two kinds of data that we have heard about previously. Um, one is uh, experience sampling data, which is self-report data. Um, and the other one is um, smartphone metadata. So all smartphones keep a log of how often, um, how frequently they were accessed and how long each session uh, was when they were accessed. And so we are able to get this data fairly easily off of people's smartphones after all the consenting procedures have you know, taken place. 
one advantage of this is that obviously we are preserving a lot of um, anonymity and, and kind of it is somewhat of a black box because we don't know what apps people are using. So we can only make claims about smartphone use. So while on the one hand, this is privacy preserving, um, on the other hand, we can't make claims about specific social media platforms or social media at all. Uh, but in this paper that we published in JPSP, we ask the question, uh, to what extent are these contextual dimensions that I just talked about associated with differences in patterns of smartphone use? Um, and uh, essentially, uh, what we had was, uh, we had uh, a number of participants provide us with, you know, 17,000 experience sampling observations, uh, completing roughly four surveys a day for 21 days. Um, and we really cared about context. And so, uh, one thing that researchers should note is that generally when, when studying context in social media, it's really important to settle a priori on a theoretically justified time frame. Uh, there is a lot of talk these days about situating media effects in specific time frames. And so uh, we really want to think carefully about how to operationalize time. Uh, and that's not appreciated uh, as, as well as it should be. Um, be that as it may, so in, in the study, we had um, you know participants provide us about their physical locations over the past hour or 15 minutes. Um, and I'll talk a bit about why we relied on self-report and not GPS data in a little bit. Um, but this, this study, you know, we measured all the context variables using self-report data, largely because while we did have sensing data to corroborate um, all of these categories, um, the sensing data was sparse and it was still being pre-processed at the time uh, when we were writing this paper up. And so that's perhaps a lesson in, 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 in dealing with sensing data generally it is that it takes a lot of uh, effort and time and you need to have a dedicated group of multidisciplinary scientists in, in order to really push forward uh, the cleaning and wrangling of, of sensing data. But I, I'll get to that in a little bit. So um, we collected all this rich context data by asking people about you know where they were, whom they were with um, and things like that. Uh, but then we also kind of, uh, sensed or collected metadata from their smartphones to understand how often they use their phones um, and for how long they did so. And, and we generally found that people to use we generally found that people use their smartphones roughly four times for uh, an average of six to eight minutes per waking hour um, during their day. Um, and yeah, I won't go into the the within person between person distinctions necessarily because Lowe's uh, talked about it. But but we can when we look at the results, I'll, I'll mention it briefly uh, just in the interest of time. Um, okay, so this is what I really wanted to talk about, which is you know on the one hand you have smartphone usage logs which are measured in continuous time, right? Like they're time stamped with when people open their phones um, and. Uh, on the other hand, you have experience sampling data that came in at random times, four times a day. Um, and you have these two very different like time variables that you somehow have to make compatible with, with each other in order to merge the data sets, in order to be able to have a, a collective corpus of data that contains both sensing as well as self-report data. And so this is one of the big challenges that we faced because we really did not want to make strong assumptions about um, you know where people were or like, have sliding windows. We wanted to have a simple approach that we could explain to people, where, whereas also kind of maintaining um, some kind of rigor in our in our fusion strategy. So what we went with was we just we we tried to match smartphone logs with experience sampling data in such a manner uh, that maximum temporal overlap was ensured. Um, and you know you can ask me questions about it if you have any, or you can read the paper for the specific details. Um, but we got a lot of reviewer pushback um, who were, I, I suspect most of our reviewers were traditional psychologists who were contesting the way in which we merged um, this data. So in an ideal world, you would do some kind of a multiverse analysis in which you merge the data uh, in, in multiple different ways and see what proportion of the findings are significant. Um, but since this was a one of its kind study, we, we kind of just went with the maximum overlap approach. Um, we conducted a series of multi-level gamma hurdle and negative binomial models. Um, these are fancy sounding, but they're really, really cool, honestly, statistical models that can account for a surplus of zero values uh, that are inherent in a lot of sensing data, because as you can expect for a lot of the time, you know, there might be hours and people just don't use their smartphones when they're sleeping. Um, and so in, in, instead of filtering out that data, um, we were able to mod model the presence of zeros by using gamma hurdle and negative binomial hurdle models. 
Um, and uh, we spent a long time disentangling between and within person effects or context predictors. Um, this was more labor intensive than anticipated, especially because we didn't use M plus or other software that automatically do this for you. This was all done manually in R. Um, and, and, you know, we can talk more about that later as well. Um, and um, we basically had separate models for each context. Um, and we did a kind of iterative model, model building strategy where uh, demographic variables were supplemented with personality variables, which were then supplemented with context variables to see if there was meaningful changes in model fit metrics with the addition of each subsequent class of variables. Okay, um, and just some exemplary findings here. Um, uh, we found that physical context, you know, there are many physical contexts that are significantly quote unquote associated with how much people use their phones. Uh, so for instance, this, this was a student population of young adults. We found that people used their phones for shorter durations when they were on campus, uh, at the library. Uh, similarly, uh, social context, um, our reference category there was when people were alone and we found that smartphones were used uh, are less likely to be unlocked when they were with family members. Um, and similarly, we have these, you know, findings consistently across each contextual dimension that we operationalized, suggesting that that there is something meaningful being captured here, uh, something that scholars of media and technology should should take note of. In terms of the key methods takeaways, so uh, you know, if you if you have questions about how to do the sensing data collection, there are now multiple third party um, providers who can offer the service to you, such as Ethica Data or Years. Um, and, you know, for, for a nominal fee based on how many respondents and how many observations you're collecting, you can, um, you can basically use these third-party vendors. They get participants to download an app on their phones and they, they, you can collect smartphone sensing data. Um, uh, and however, once it's collected, I think we spent a very long time, roughly three years pre-processing our data. We had like five different corpuses of smartphone sensing data. Um, you know, each one was collected with the different apps. It was really messy. Uh, we had to hire a computer scientist to do all of this because admittedly we were, we were all trained as psychologists and that kind of, you know, helped us recognize that we do need to have multidisciplinary teams if you're doing this kind of research. Um, and it's especially difficult because I say this cautiously, but as social scientists, we don't have established theoretical constraints on how we should be pre-processing sensing data. Um, and that's particularly consequential because our pre-processing decisions, you know, cascade down into our findings. Um, and so there are some innovations being made, like definitely by the folks on this call and by other very eminent social scientists. Uh, but back in the day that there wasn't, you know, an established kind of consensus on how to analyze this data. Um, it's somewhat easier to pre-process digital media data, digital metadata logs, because they are not multidimensional. Uh, as I said, the aggregation across temporal levels of analysis is very important. Um, and um, whereas self-report data offers a good starting point for analyzing context data, um, it is um, it is not the and it, and it might be the only viable source for certain key variables like psychological context, right? Like we might be able to sense behavioral context, social context, but uh, things that are subjective. And if you really want to get inside people's heads and see what's going on um, and measure psychological context, the easiest way to do that is to ask them. Um, okay, so everything else is also important. I should say that the computing power is really high. Uh, for a lot of these models, uh, partially because you're separating out within and between person components of variance, but also because there are lots of control variables typically that reviewers want to see included. Um, and that complicates the models really quickly. Real, um, and then as a result, you, you do need to have virtual instances or, or virtual machines, as uh, has been said before, to run these models. Um, okay. And I so hate I know that it, Sumer, we're at yeah. one thirty, so I'm yeah. so sorry to jump in. I think what we'll do is have you share your slides so that others can see the the other the other study that you wanted to get to. And I'm so sorry that there isn't time to get it all in. Um, 
fabulous set no of talks. Truly, truly appreciate everyone sharing their amazing insights. Uh, and uh, thank you to all who joined and asked such great questions. I've put into chat and we'll send out an email to as well. But uh, if you want to learn more and to let us know about other kinds of workshops and opportunities that you would find interesting and helpful, please um, follow that link and give us some feedback. Um, but please, everybody who's on, please join me in thanking our fabulous set of speakers. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you all uh, for joining and hope everyone stays cool, dry, depending on uh, what you're dealing with this weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank